Good morning, everyone. I wanted to start by recognizing the incredible work to get us through this once in a generation crisis. A global pandemic has caused incredible economic challenge and damages. It's taken the support and effort of just about every agency and state government, plus local and federal partners, and has had an emotional toll that will never be fully measured all while we've been physically separated for far too long. With this in mind, I think it's important to take a moment and reflect on this difficult work and commitment of many across the state. And I'd like to thank a few groups for their service today. I'll start by thanking the legislature, which ended its session on Friday night, at least temporarily. And while we haven't seen eye to eye on everything, I want to thank the speaker and pro tem and the entire legislature for their efforts to keep moving forward while navigating incredible challenges. Like so many others, they've had to find new ways to do things, and they did so while fulfilling their commitment to serving Vermonters who elected them. Next, I want to thank the many state employees who've been working incredibly hard throughout this pandemic, and much of that work started before some Vermonters even heard of the coronavirus. It's hard to believe, but it's been a little over five months, 159 days to be exact, since the Health Operations Center opened to track this new virus. And we're now approaching four months, 109 days, since we fully activated the SEOC, the state's emergency operations system. This entails a team of over 100 and the extended team of several hundred. So I want to recognize the entire public health, safety, and emergency response teams for their dedication to Vermonters, their expertise, and their perseverance. But we know this challenge extends beyond just the emergency response. So I also want to recognize our employees at the Departments of Labor, Finance, Financial Regulation, and Public Service, as well as the agencies of Administration, Commerce, education, digital services, human services, transportation, agriculture, and natural resources, who have been there on the front lines helping their teammates out when needed with economic or health recovery efforts. They've all been doing double duty, dealing with unusual challenges brought by the coronavirus while helping Vermonters with their day-to-day -day lives. And of course, I continue to be so grateful to all Vermonters our business owners, utility companies, nonprofits, municipal leaders, and so many others who stepped up to help their neighbors, sacrificed to save lives, and stayed united against this virus. This has not been easy for anyone. And while we've come a long way, we know it's not over, and it will be a while longer before we're truly back to normal. But if we continue with the same spirit and commitment we've been uh, going through over the last four months, I know we'll get through this and be stronger than we were before. But to do that, as a reminder, we're going to have to continue to stay home when sick, keep physically separated, wash our hands, and wear a mask when around others if you can. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for an update. Good morning. Just to give a quick recap of our current data, <clears throat> 1,208 total cases, 949 recovered. There's been no change in the 56 deaths in quite a number of weeks. This is the curve, and as you can see, um, similar slope to where we've been previously. And then over the weekend, in the last three days, there were a total of 10 new cases in the state. None of these 10 new cases that are represented here um, were part of the outbreaks that we have been following. Uh, so there's really no new news to report regarding the outbreaks. This 10 cases is in the setting, though, again, of uh, abundant testing. And again, 
because we're doing so much testing, the number of positive cases is but a small fraction. So the percent positive of all the tests is low. I'd like to add that uh, with regard to uh, one of the outbreaks, we did specific community testing in Fairhaven over the weekend, and well over 200 tests were all negative. And <clears throat> I show you all this data at a time that, as you know, our country is actually seeing an upsurge, about a 65% upsurge in the last two weeks, with over something in the range of 40,000 cases a day and recent single-day records in a number of states, including Florida, Nevada, South Carolina, and previously Texas and California. On the day that we had six cases, Florida had 10,000. The governor of Texas was asking the population once again to stay at home. Bars that were considered to be a significant contributor and many of the high-profile cases have been closed. And hospital and ICU capacity has been stressed in Mississippi, Houston, and Arizona. And again, those under age 40 seem to account for half of the new cases in Florida and even a state like Washington, and most of the new cases in Texas. Now, I'm saying all this not to make comparisons with Vermont and certainly not to say one is better, one is worse, but really to try to look at some of the lessons that we can learn and to point out why we take such pains in reinforcing the four core messages that the governor just repeated. Many of these messages, it appears from the data that's coming out of some of these states, reflects in that uh, we're not adhered to strictly um, in those states as they reopened, specifically the social distancing and the uh, facial covering. We also, of course, continue to talk about all of the considerations people should have with regard to close contact and the concept I introduced last week of the exposure budget because really the virus is still here and it really preys upon the ability of human beings to spread it through the air that we all breathe and share. I want to spend a few moments discussing a couple topics that came up at the last press conference. First was the issue of what is recovered? How is that defined? To meet that definition, you can uh, do this in one of two ways. If an individual that we at the health department have been following reports to us directly that they have recovered during a follow-up call, they are regarded as recovered. And secondly, if greater than a 30-day period has elapsed since the onset of their illness. Next thing I wanted to touch on was that all-important issue of healthcare workers who have tested positive with COVID. Overall, almost 20% of cases have identified themselves as healthcare workers, one in five Vermonters. 35% of the healthcare workers were associated with an outbreak. Of those not in an outbreak, 70% were identified as cases later March and early April when we had the predominant increase in cases in the state. These individuals appear to be somewhat younger than the non-healthcare workers with COVID, 20 to 50 year age range. 70% have been female. 84% were symptomatic and the majority, 92%, were not hospitalized. It's been hard to find states to do comparisons with that have the same data, but at least one, Washington State, where 13% of their population is employed in the healthcare sector, had 37% of their positive cases reporting employment in the healthcare sector. 
Why do we see these kinds of phenomena? I think everyone recognizes these are frontline workers quite often. That increases their risk. They're also potentially more frequently tested. And finally, though I don't have the exact percent, they do comprise a significant proportion of our workforce in Vermont. So I'd like to end with recognizing the entire healthcare workforce who on a daily basis try to deliver the highest quality, most compassionate care while avoiding becoming one of these statistics. They're donning PPE and often very challenging climate circumstances, and they're frequently worried about passing the virus on to others, including their families. They truly deserve our gratitude and appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. With that, we'll open it up to questions. All right, thank you, Governor. So, <clears throat> as you mentioned, the legislature on Friday passed half a bill, some north of half a billion dollars in business relief, broadband, education funding. Um, I guess I was wondering if I could just get your thoughts, sort of, on maybe you know what was in, what's in the bill, sort of you know what you think about it, and maybe if you had any concerns. Yeah. We'll determine that over the next couple of days. We'll have, um, we haven't received the bills, obviously, at this point, uh, but we want to get a side-by-side -side, uh, in comparison to what we had promoted uh, versus what they had passed. Um, again, my concerns have been not enough economic relief for businesses, um, but that doesn't mean we can't come back in, uh, in August and September to deal with that, and we'll have a better idea of, uh, of the fallout uh, from this over the next month or so. Um, we received 14 bills from the legislature that were passed previous to Friday, on Friday. Uh, so this takes up a great deal of time uh, for our staff, our general counsel uh, in particular, in going through the bills, making sure they're technically um, correct, and then, uh, and then whether they have the content uh, that I can support. So uh, hard to say. Uh, it's going to be um, a, a tremendous uh, uh, amount of work over the next few days uh, to get all these compiled and then determine uh, whether I'll sign them or not. But uh, from what I've seen so far, uh, the, the vast majority of them uh, will, will be able to be passed. I don't know that there's anything uh, serious in, in terms of uh, my reservations. And um, when the, the speaker, she held a press conference this morning, and she said that when everything is said and done between um, your plan and the legislature's plan, uh, in terms of the business relief, there really wasn't much of a, a difference in terms of the dollar amount. Well, I think there's a hundred million dollars difference if I if I have that right. But we'll uh, we'll see. Hundred million dollars, a lot of money to me. Uh, but we'll we'll see if that's uh, again. We'll get a side by side and uh, be able to give you the exact numbers uh, when that uh, uh, when we get that comprised. And then the last follow-up question. So your administration will be tasked with rolling this out, and the ACCD will be uh, distributing these funds. Um, when will Vermonters and business owners start seeing cash? Should be uh, very soon. Uh, we had, uh, as we had said from the very beginning, uh, it would be by the time uh, the bills got to us, we'd need a couple weeks to put whatever uh, plan in place uh, to distribute the funds, and it all depended on what they had included in the legislation. Um, uh, they made it a little bit more difficult in some of their provisions, uh, but we're working our way through that. We should be able to uh, announce the first round uh, on Wednesday, uh, so we can look forward to that, and then uh, maybe the second round uh, the following week. Liz? Um, this question might be for Dr. Levine, but Governor, you might want to weigh in as well. We've heard some of the reports that over the weekends there were a couple of Burlington bars that were in violation of the capacity requirements. Um, specifically people who weren't social distancing inside and again there were more people inside than were allowed. Um, I don't know if you just want to weigh in on, on if you're concerned about that. I know in at least one of the incidents this particular bar was fined by the Burlington Police Department. So just to again reiterate the importance of those capacity requirements and if you have a message for bars and restaurants about that. Well again we're seeing across the country where this is uh, in Texas in particular, Florida, uh, where this is problematic. Uh, so we're very concerned uh, about this and we'll take whatever action we have to uh, to make sure that we don't uh, encourage the spread of the virus. Dr. Levine? 
makes me feel good that I began my discussion this morning uh, calling out bars, not that I'm anything against bars, but in the states that have had the most dramatic change uh, that's been clearly recognized as part of the problem. And the problem, of course, is not having a bar. It may not even be the owner of the bar. It's just the behavior of those who are in the bar. So we have to be very, very conscientious. Um, it's all about the physical distancing. And the way that the restarting Vermont process has started up, we're paying attention to physical distancing all the time. And that's why there are always things in percentages of full capacity, uh, making sure that an individual has the opportunity to be distanced in the appropriate way, et cetera. So that's critical. And then it's that time indoors again. When you're indoors, if you're in close contact with people, if you're there for a long period of time, and if there are a lot of people there in the room, uh, no matter how good the ventilation, you need to begin to think twice about, is this too risky for me? Did I just spend my entire exposure budget in the last 20 minutes, and I ought to be very careful now? Uh, so again, we're not asking people to stop having fun in life and to stop doing things they enjoy to do, but again, you've got to have that sense of a little bit of conscientiousness about how you go about your life now in a different way than we did previously and until we get a vaccine and things are improved for the whole population. So thanks for bringing that up. All right, we can go to the phones now, starting with Chris Roy at the Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. Couple of questions. Given the uptick of the uh, increase of, virus, of the virus, would you consider tightening the spigot a little bit? And um, we've also seen a lot of place of Vermont State folks in this area over the weekend, and how can we be assured that those individuals are following the guidelines and that says uh, social distancing and quarantining for the 14 days? Well, a couple of things, uh, Chris. First of all, uh, you know, we haven't really seen an uptick here in Vermont. Our positivity rate is, uh, is amongst the lowest, if not the lowest in the country. Um, so we feel good about where we're at, uh, so I'm not uh, contemplating uh, tightening the spigot at this point in time, but if we did see the numbers uh, rise, uh, then that would be a concern uh, for me, and we'll take action uh, as a result of that. But uh, but right now, we feel good about our numbers and the approach that we're taking. Um, we're watching the data and the science, and making sure we're doing uh, opening uh, for the right reasons. Um, in terms of uh, those coming in from other states, we have opened up uh, the uh, the ability to come to the state uh, without quarantining if you come from a safe county. As we, uh, as we talked about on Friday, um, won't be talking about it this Friday, but, uh, uh, but we'll uh, continue to, to watch uh, the other counties in uh, the expanded uh, states that we uh, discussed on, on Friday. So it's perfectly okay uh, for them to come without quarantining. Uh, but it's really important that we all adhere uh, to those safety measures I talked about in my opening remarks. You know, just stay physically separated and, uh, and wear a mask if you can. Uh, wash your hands a lot. And if you're sick, stay away from others, stay home. So um, those adhere to, to, whether, uh, to people, whether they're visiting here or, or coming here or those who live here. So it's all the same. Okay, thank you. Greg, the county courier. Greg, the county courier. All right, we'll go to Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, <coughs> thanks for back then. <coughs> Governor. Excuse me. You don't sound too good there, Mike. Importantly, uh, yeah. <laughs> the uh, Vermont National Guard was alerted last year that a major deployment was coming up, probably in 2021. A breeder in Colchester wants to know what you've been told about whether the guard is still getting called up in light of COVID-19. Are they going sooner or later, or what's the latest timetable? 
Uh, Mike, I didn't get the first part of that. Um, could you just repeat the first part of the question? Yeah, the uh, Vermont National Guard oh. was alerted last year that a major deployment of troops was coming uh, probably sometime maybe early 2021. And the reader in Colchester wants to know what's the latest timetable on on that if they're still going or what yeah let me get with uh, general knight on that and get back to you uh, last i heard i believe that's been delayed but i just want to uh to make sure that i have my facts uh, straight uh, that was a while ago uh there's been a couple of deployments uh, contemplated but i but i believe uh that may be delayed at this point but i'll i'll check it out and get back to you on that great thank you very much for your time I think Greg is now on the line. Greg, the county courier. Okay. Hi, Governor. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead, Greg. Hi, Governor. Um, I was told on Friday that I'd get these questions over the weekend. It's not well, Friday, but I. Still I think you. Heard I think you demanded. So, I think you demanded them on on Monday, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Greg, um, I think you should have gotten an email from Ethan giving you the contact information in order to get that info on Friday around 2 o'clock. Uh, well, I, I was told that I would be sent the information. Um, I, I'm looking to find out how a case turns from a positive case to a recovered case. And uh, I'm, I'm still wondering why the state isn't putting out uh, information on current cases per county or municipality instead of just uh, overall cases for the last now five months uh dr levine do you have any of the answers to that at this point he should have received an email over the weekend regarding the second half in the first half i just presented in my opening comments maybe you could just repeat that thing. i believe the first part of your question greg i answered in my opening comments uh, what constitutes a recovered case and uh, the second part, I believe our uh, communications division emailed you over the weekend. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll go back and look. I was having trouble connecting with you guys, so I missed part of your statement. So I, I'll go back and look. Thank you. Sure. All right, Wilson, the AP. Um, hi, uh, morning, everybody. Uh, two questions. One for the governor. You talked about some of the stuff that was passed by the legislature on Friday night, and I'm curious what you think of uh, S219. Uh, I use the number rather than try and characterize it because I don't think I could characterize it quickly. Um, and secondly, um, speaking about recovered cases, et cetera, and this is for Dr. Levine, I guess. Um, since Vermont is now using active cases in those counties to decide who can come here, um, can we get active cases in Vermont listed on our daily COVID uh, homepage or whatever this thing is called? I mean, it would be interesting to compare what's going on here with those. And those are my two questions. Um, Wilson, uh, S219, I'm just not familiar with what that is. Um, if it was passed on Friday night, it will take probably a week or so, at least maybe a two weeks uh, before we receive that. Uh, from uh, the uh, from the legislature, uh, and then uh, then I'll take a look. But uh, but I just don't know what that what that bill is. That's the police reform bill. Oh, I see. Okay, you will. got it. Yeah, got I it. mean, again, I I was trying to avoid the buzzword. Yeah, You're calling it that. But yeah, that the idea of that bill. Yeah. Um, again, I think uh, I haven't spoken to Commissioner Sherling about this, and I plan to. Um, we had some concerns uh, with the bill. Uh, but the majority of the bill we had no problem with. So unless there's something that has changed, I wouldn't expect uh, that we would stand in the way. Okay. Dr. Good. Levine. For your other question regarding uh, active cases, I'm going to double check this, but basically if you look at our total number of cases, and subtract the deaths and subtract the people we already regard as recovered, there's a finite number of individuals in that group who usually are falling within that 30 days 
So 30 days have not okay. yet gone by, uh, so we can't officially call them recovered. Um, and they, they would be more akin to the active cases that you're looking for. Um, okay, is that something? I mean, we could all do the, the arithmetic, but uh, since you are using active cases as a way to measure who can come here, um, it would be interesting to uh, sure. see that laid out in an easier to get format. Yeah, I get it. Uh, so I'll, we'll double check to be sure that there is no other category of cases in that group, um, and then talk to the team about how we represent them. Okay, thank you. And that answers my questions. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Good morning. We've opened up travel to certain counties in other states. Do we get a sense, though, of the demand to travel here? I was speaking with a few folks in the lodging industry last week, and they said, you know, expanding the map definitely helps, but if people aren't comfortable traveling in the first place, you know, there's really only so much that, you know, can be done to salvage the summer tourism season. So I guess, are we, do we have a sense of how many people want to come to Vermont, want to travel here, and are we doing anything to maybe advertise more broadly that? you know, we are open to business if you're coming from a safe county. Yeah, a couple things, Kat. Um, uh, anecdotally, uh, we just heard from Chris uh, in, from Newport, and uh, his question was about uh, with the uptick and seeing so many new faces uh, in, the, in the town and community uh, about, you know, the provisions of social distancing and so forth. Um, so I would say uh, that people are coming. Uh, when I look at the, the, the data uh, that we're receiving uh, in some of the, uh, the automated uh, type of uh, approach that we've taken in counting the vehicles coming into the state and leaving, um, it appears that we are uh, increasing uh, travel. So again, uh, while I don't know where they're coming from, uh, there is an uptick. Um, and what we're trying to do uh, in terms of uh, ACCD, and I'll ask uh, Commissioner Curley uh, to comment as well, but uh, we're trying to uh, uh, to market uh, Vermont to Vermonters first, uh, but uh, but I believe that there is still a demand to come to Vermont because of our, you know, low positivity rate and and so forth, and and so I believe uh, we will be seeing uh, more travelers coming to Vermont. Uh, Commissioner or Secretary Curley, uh, do you have anything to add to the marketing? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, Governor, what you said is. Um, think that there is a demand for people to come here because we're safe, but our team is also preparing um, to market, to target, to market into those areas, um, as Pat mentioned, that we're opening up more broadly um, within the drive range. So, um, you know, yes, there's, there's several things we're trying to rely on, but we will be bolstering our activity and trying to reach the areas that are, that are in that 400 or less active cases per 1 million. I think we'll know so better. What, is that, what does that kind of marketing effort look like? Um, I can connect you with our marketing team and, and get you a little more information on that. Um, you know, it's, I will just, full disclosure, you know, they have a way of, of reaching into those areas and they're working on that plan. So still being developed, but I'm happy to, you know, get you connected. Cool. And would I be able to get the data um, from the automated approach to counting those vehicles? Yeah, I can. Um, uh, and see what kind of. We could provide that to you. Awesome. Thank you. Chris Mays, Brattleboro Reformer. Hi, this question is for Dr. Levine, I think. Um, can you say whether the. Uh, the positivity rate has fluctuated at all um, throughout the last few months, or whether it has it has it generally stayed or, or hovered around the same area. Uh, 
Yeah, so we put up a uh, slide of the positivity rate where obviously zero, 14%, so this is in a couple percent range right here. These are the number of tests performed, these are the number of positive tests. So you will see that there's been a slight uptick at the time we had the outbreaks, as one would expect, um, but that's quickly come back down again. Um, and none of them have been anything like where we were way back in the beginning of the uh, experience with COVID-19 in Vermont. I, I don't know if I answered everything you asked, so make sure I did or ask it again. Yeah, no, thanks. That's, that's you did. All right, thanks, Chris. Eric, the town Argus. Yeah, uh, so do we consider the Fairhaven cluster to be contained? Dr. Levine. It's way too early in the experience to, to actually say that. Um, but all indications are it's not growing by leaps and bounds, I can say that. We've had a total of 12 cases associated with it. Two of those cases are actually people who live in Vermont. The others live in New York. <clears throat> we did have some work site testing uh, several days ago. And, um, and as I mentioned earlier, we did have some community testing as well. Um, the team is working with the employer to make sure that all those who were eligible for testing and needed to be tested have been tested, so I could give you a better idea about that as well. Um, and as I've said with the Winooski-Burlington outbreak, we, we're far from even going through one incubation period of the virus yet, so it's very challenging to call something totally contained when uh, it's so early in the course. But clearly, as I said, we're not showing dramatic expansion, which indicates that initial efforts to uh, contain the virus are successful. And in these 900 plus that have recovered, have there been any reports of any kind of complications, maybe lung damage, trouble breathing, anything that might hint at long-term impacts from the virus? Yeah, so so far the answer to that is no, but um, I think that's the million dollar question that people here and elsewhere in the world want to know the answer to. Um, the, and the fact is we just don't have that much knowledge at this point in time. Um, I've heard you know, only anecdotal reports from uh, patients as well as physicians regarding um, what happened to their pulmonary function tests in terms of breathing tests what happened to their x-rays. Um, and a lot of people feel very comforted by the fact that most of those things have gone well. But I don't want to say that that's the rule and there aren't exceptions, um, because I don't think we actually know that at this point. Uh, so more, more to come on that you know, from a much bigger experience than just Vermont. Um, but at this point in time, it'd be hard for me to say um, I, I could give you a generalization about that. Okay, thank you. Derek, seven days. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to uh, confirm that uh, in light of uh, the cases in other states that you referenced, uh, specifically being tied to, to bars, that, uh, they, that you're not rethinking or reexamining the current guidelines in, in Vermont for those, for those settings, that, that, you were, that you are in fact so confident that, that Vermont's got it right. Yeah, I'll ask Dr. Levine to com comment as well, but from my standpoint, uh, nothing has given me pause at this point. Uh, we're seeing the data uh, continue to, to stay uh, about normal. We've had um, two or three outbreaks uh, that we feel as though we have a handle on. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, with the low positivity rate, um, I see no reason uh, to move backwards. I think we'll continue to move forward, uh, but I am uh, concerned about uh, as was reported, if, if we're having non-compliance in some of uh, some establishments, we'll have to, to reflect on that and see if there's anything we can do to make sure there's compliance because that's, 
that is the answer, right? And we just need to, in these settings, uh, not to, to socially distance ourselves and, uh, and use some common sense. So uh, if we continue to do that, uh, we'll be okay. Um, but we'll, we'll have to, uh, again, reflect on that and, and make sure that uh, everyone is complying in the manner that we had, uh, we had laid out. Dr. Levine. Yes, thank you, Governor. Very little to add to that. The, the major thing I would add is that we didn't go from closed to open. We went from closed to phased opening of anything in, in indoor settings, whether it be a retail store or whether it be a restaurant. Uh, so um, I think that approach uh, is definitely paying off. Um, there have been other states where they essentially did go from closed to open. Um, so this gives us the opportunity to look at the data every time a change is made, every time the spigot gets turned to a certain degree. And I think that's been very uh, heartening to us to be able to make sure that our, our numbers don't dramatically change. But clearly, we have to watch these things very closely, and that's what we're doing. All set, Derek? Yeah, thank you. Um, we had a, a reader uh, write in to ask, you know, what is the status of commercial testing in Vermont? Like, you know, con tests conducted by CVS or kind of commercial private labs. Um, I, I honestly couldn't say whether it was included in the testing reported in the, um, you know, daily numbers or how many are conducted in the state. I was hoping you could clarify that for me. Um, again, I'll let Dr. Levine, we're working on some of those scenarios as we speak, uh, trying to expand our testing in other, other ways. We're, we're doing a, um, a good job uh, in terms of the UVM lab as well as our public health lab and the state lab, um, but we want to increase that. We want more testing, uh, so uh, we're trying to venture out and, and encourage uh, some of these uh, commercial entities to do just that. Right, so the main commercial entity uh, thus far has been the Walmart and Derby, I believe. And we've had a lot of discussions with pharmacies. Frankly, um, the impression of some of us is that the pharmacies think Vermont are uh, small potatoes in the big game. Uh, and they've been very focused on more major urban areas uh, around the country. However, we are ongoing in our discussions with them and making sure that uh, we can bring them online because we do think that's going to be an important resource for us uh, over the long term. Um, I'm not aware, unless Secretary Smith is, of, of a particular pharmacy that's actually active right now um, and doing samples. So we don't have any data to follow because they're not actually involved yet. The only one. Uh, the only other commercial enterprise is the Walmart. And that has not spread to all of the Walmarts in the state. Uh, why that particular Walmart, if you don't mind my asking? I think that was a decision that um, the company made, along with an area of the state that did not have as much testing uh, actively going on. Is it, a, is it been a challenge at all to get people access to tests in remote regions? Is that part of the reason why you're interested in kind of having kind of commercial entities in existing locations to fill that gap? No, oh, there, are, there are many, many reasons. You, you cite one, which I think is, is a very reasonable one, um, though we, we also still do pop-ups, uh, but obviously it's nicer to have something that you can get on the day you want it rather than on the day it shows up to town. So that would be one thing. Plus there are many audiences for testing that would love to have uh, access to as great a menu as possible. So for instance, we've been talking about travelers coming into the state uh, and wanting to get that day seven test after they've been quarantining for a week so they can quickly get on and, and do what they want to do and enjoy in Vermont. There's um, 
a lot, a lot of future opportunities that we have with um, other populations, uh, whether they be populations of a certain type of worker, whether they potentially be college students returning to the state. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to have as many options available. And I think that's really the, the fundamental philosophical principle here is we want to have options available so that people on a um, relatively unscheduled basis, if you will, can get a test um, conveniently. Okay, and since it's a partnership in this instance, like you're working on a potential partnership, uh, I'm guessing it would kind of be included in the testing numbers for the state? I think that would be insisted upon. And we, we really do want to, we do, do want and need to keep tracking that. It's the only way we have reassurance about some of the data that I showed you this morning that we're doing enough testing so that we are seeing a, a representative idea of how we're doing in Vermont. And, you know, we've exceeded that threshold and we want to continue to. Uh, so we need an accurate count of tests every day. All right. Thank you very much. Steve, NEKTV. Hello, can you hear me? Can. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, a quick one for the doctor and maybe one for the governor, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, I heard a, a report from somebody who, who worked in the Stowe area uh, of some folks who had just just came up from the D.C. metro area uh, to stay at their condo or something, and and uh, there was no mention of quarantining or anything, and they like were immediately out and patronizing local businesses and stuff. Um, is the word getting out about quarantining uh, to to these newly arrived visitors, and and how can people in local businesses protect themselves if not? I would hope that the word is getting out, um, especially because we've tried to make it easier, if you will, on people. Um, and I think nationwide now, the notion of quarantine as a rule that a state can set is out there. You know, we just had the New Jersey, New York, I believe Connecticut kind of trio uh, talk about that and publicize that widely. There are many other states that have been doing something very similar to what we're doing. Uh, so I, I think it's hard to be a traveler now and, and not think of that. And if these folks that you're anecdotally reporting um, were coming up from DC and they were going to a condo that they owned perhaps, um, I would think that they would be aware of what's going on in the state. But I think, again, this is now, and I'm not trying to create a, um, a police state where people are getting a little too aggressive with watching out, but we all have to be watching out for each other in this pandemic and all trying to adhere to best practices. And best practices include all of the things we've been preaching and making sure that people try to adhere to, but they also include um, making sure that people don't come into the state and, uh, un and, and unwittingly perhaps bring virus with them that we would not have seen otherwise. Uh, so um, gentle conversations with one another um, can go a long way and um, making sure that people allow themselves to be courteous and respectful but at the same time if they're concerned um, to be able to discuss these issues freely. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, Governor, a couple if I may, do you support uh, defunding the police? And um, did, did you admit on Friday that it was your office who had uh, changed the AOT's graffiti policy? Um, well, th two things. One, I think I answered uh, the defunding question, I think it was either Wednesday or Monday when I was asked the question. And, and I don't support uh, defunding of uh, the police. I, I believe that we uh, should do things differently, uh, that we 
have an opportunity uh, to do that. But, uh, but I, if anything, we might need more funding uh, for public safety. Um, in terms of emitting, I, I think I did uh, tell you that in consultation with the, uh, the governor's office, uh, it wasn't with me directly, uh, but, um, but we did uh, issue guidance uh, with, the, with VTRANS on what we'd like to see in light of, of the circumstances uh, throughout the country and just be a little bit more acceptable of, uh, of that First Amendment right. Sure. And how about reparations? Uh, reparations, I, reparations. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's a question that's been out there for quite some time, and, and I answered this as well. I don't know if you were on the call or not, uh, maybe a week or two ago. And, and it really is a, a question of, you know, how do you do that, and who's affected, and, and, and how do you distribute the money, and where does it come from? So um, there are conversations that we may have, uh, you know, in the legislature or uh, nationwide. But again, uh, there's a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, I, I know, uh, and right out my front window, I can see a memorial to all the people in this area who had uh, left their, the fields and farms and, and gone to, to fight in the, uh, in the Civil War. And, uh, and I, I don't think they should be forgotten either. Right. But anyways, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Joe Barton Chronicle. I'm um, slow, Governor. As often happens with me, I realize I've been uh, hearing some words that I may not fully understand, and maybe you or Dr. Levine can clarify them for me. In the past few weeks' uh, slides that Dr. Levine has been presenting, um, there's a page that is headed, Vermont is starting to flatten the curve. And maybe I don't really understand what flatten the curve means. I can see that the number of cases is going up. Obviously, it can't go down because that's already happened. Um, what will we see when we have flattened the curve? Yeah, you bring up a good point, Joe. In, in some respects, you know, the curve is always going to go up uh, because we'll continue to have uh, positive cases and so forth. Uh, but it's just a measure of how do you flatten it out from there. I'll let Dr. Levine uh, try uh, to explain it as well. So we've had two experiences to flatten the curve. When the virus first presented in Vermont and we started to accumulate cases, we quickly recognized this is not the slope we wanted to see and that this was approaching that exponential growth pattern that the virus is capable of. So all of the mitigation strategies were put into play, which included reducing the mass gathering sizes dramatically, which included social distancing, of course, which included closing schools eventually, closing restaurants, and eventually staying at home. So here's the result. That curve is way flatter than this curve. Most recently, we've had a couple of outbreaks. So the curve did not, did not assume the slope that it was previously, thank goodness, but it did assume a slope that was different than where we had been. So now we are flattening that again. But we're not doing it through all those same strategies. We're now able to do it through the containment strategy, the testing, the isolation of those positive, the contact tracing, and the quarantining of those who are contact traced. We don't need to necessarily go back and shut everything down and stay at home again like unfortunately a couple other states are now having to do. So we have the contact tracing capability and the testing capability to flatten the curve again with this containment strategy. So that's the, the notion. We probably should label the graph as starting, Vermont is again flattening the curve. Okay, so the, the, the goal then is to, um, and I know this is a, a big goal, is to have no cases, at which point the curve will be flat. 
Right. And we know that in the United States, no matter where you are, there will be virus and there will be cases. So it will never be totally flat. But flattening is the concept. And again, the reason is not only do less of us become sick and less of us have the potential for serious complications, but our healthcare system doesn't experience the kind of surge that would overwhelm it uh, and lead to all kinds of disasters because we had so many cases going on that the system couldn't handle their care. I understand. Thank you very much. Guy Page. Hello, Governor. Secretary, Secretary Kondo said in a recent op-ed that, uh, quote, widespread voter fraud, including by mail, just doesn't happen, unquote. Over the weekend, the press reported that one in five ballots in a New Jersey vote by mail election uh, were fraudulent. Uh, with that news and the fact that Vermont town clerks don't have signatures on file to compare with signatures on absentee ballots, um, ha have you received S348 yet? And if so, uh, are you thinking about a veto? I uh, did receive it <clears throat> on, uh, on Friday. It was one of those 14 bills that were presented uh, and as I stated earlier, uh, I had uh, taken myself out of the equation. It was an urgent matter, uh, something that the, the Secretary of State was uh, promoting. Um, so I had uh, concerns about, you know, different issues in terms of making a two-step process instead of a one-step process. Um, so the legislature uh, took uh, me out of the equation. Uh, it can be done by the Secretary of State. Uh, and here we are uh, at this point. And I've said uh, that I'm not going to stand in its way. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in November. I don't know whether there's going to be a resurgence of, of the virus. I want to make sure that people uh, have the opportunity to vote. Uh, and uh, they're the experts in the field. And if they can, uh, if the Secretary of State can give us um, uh, confidence that uh, there will be no um, mischief, so to speak, um, then we have to take him at his word. So he's the expert in the elections. Uh, I won't, uh, I, I know there's a technical aspect of the bill that may be problematic, but the legislature knew about that uh, before it was passed, um, so, and they didn't change it. So um, I, uh, I, pro I won't be standing in the way of, uh, of this bill coming into law. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, are you or your public safety people aware of any threats to statutes of our historic state leaders? Uh, and have you considered an executive order to prevent defacing, damaging, or toppling statues of, say, Ethan and Ira Allen, Thomas Jittenden, John Stark? Um, Guy, I am not aware of any threats, uh, but uh, maybe I'll ask our commissioner, Commissioner Sherling, whether he has heard of any. Good afternoon, Governor. I am not directly familiar with any threats, um, and I'll, I would note uh, for the record, if, if we were, I'm, I'm not sure to the extent which we would share them publicly. Mm -hmm. um, any any thought given or discussion of uh, protection if there is a threat? Um, again, Guy, I, I believe that you know we want to protect um, our history in some respects and protect some of the assets we have in the state. So I'll leave it at that and, and we'll, we'll deal with it if and when it comes. Thank you. Brittany, Local 22. Good morning. Um, so just a quick question. You mentioned uh, a couple times already now that you're concerned about, you know, some bars or restaurants maybe not complying with social distancing and all the rules that are in place. I was wondering if you might be able to give any specifics, even if it's just, you know, a town of the, what bars and stuff that you've been looking at. Yeah, well, actually, Brittany, I'm not concerned about it. I think it was one of, one of the other callers had, uh, or one of, had posed the question and had, uh, had said that there was a problem in one area in Burlington, for instance, uh, but I had not heard that before. Um, so I'm concerned if it is happening, 
uh, and uh, we'll do what we can to educate and provide guidance uh, for whatever entity uh, that might have been. So we'll look into it. Um, again, this was, uh, this was posed in a question, uh, so it wasn't something coming from me. Okay, thank you so much. Colin, VT Digger. Hi, good morning. Congratulations on how quickly you're uh, moving through the list today. This is great. <laughs> um, do, your, do your part, uh, Colin. Sorry, say it again. Do your part. <laughs> um, do we know if New York is testing in the community where the folks who tested positive in Fairhaven list? I know we've been in contact uh, with the Washington County, New York. Uh, health department and uh, and they were working with us, but I don't know the specifics. Dr. Levine? The last I was aware, which is uh, just during the weekend, um, the New York Health Department in that county was doing a lot of contact tracing. They were not specifically doing extra testing, but that's because we had been coordinating the testing already, both in Vermont, but also at the work site itself. Um, and so um, the employees that might be living in New York that were cons that concerned were going to be tested as part of the work site testing that we were doing in Vermont. Um, and we were told by a state rep uh, who heard, heard this through the business owner that um, a number of these uh, workers actually worked at a work site in Danby as opposed to Fairhaven, and I was wondering if that's um, information that you're aware of or whether that's correct. That's not information that I'm aware of. Yeah. Uh, Governor Scott, do you know the sort of UCS, uh, the U.S. Citizen Immigration Service has announced a very large round of furloughs um, across the country, which uh, Folks are expecting to hit Vermont fairly hard. I was wondering, um, are you aware of it? Do you have a sense of how many people might be affected by this and any efforts the state is making to offset those job losses? Yeah, uh, Greg from the County Courier uh, brought this up maybe a week and a half ago and posed the question, and, and I hadn't heard that uh, before he brought it up. Uh, we've since uh, tried to find out a little bit more about it. What we understand is there is going to be furloughs ac across the country. We don't know what impact it'll have uh, here locally, uh, but we expect uh, that, that we will uh, be impacted. Uh, in fact, we've heard anecdotally, uh, not officially, but anecdotally from some of those workers who have received notice that they will be furloughed. Um, maybe Commissioner Harrington, have you heard anything more uh, that I haven't elaborated on? Uh, no, Governor, I think you, you hit all the high points. I do know that they are, um, they, we reached out to them at the end of last week. Uh, they weren't aware of the specific numbers, um, but had put another request into um, their headquarters for that information. We, uh, the Department of Labor, are working actively with them um, to make sure there are uh, systems and resources in place uh, so that um, impacted employees understand and know what are what options are available for them for unemployment uh, as well as reemployment services uh, so we are continuing to work with them at the state level um, but we just don't know what the the impact is going to be yet commissioner harrington do you have a general sense of how many people the uscis employs in vermont i uh, i would have to pull that number i believe just pulling it off the top of my head um, it includes both federal workers and contracted workers, uh, and I believe it's somewhere around 1,500 um, if you combine everything together, maybe a little over that. But I will, uh, I can certainly pull the numbers that we have and get back to you. And would the UCIS, uh, USCIS be compelled to file a warrant notice, or are they exempt from that type of thing? Uh, as a federal uh, agency, they are exempt from uh, warrant requirements, both at the federal level and at the state level. However, if they have contractors, um, which, you know, in some of their service centers they do, um, then those contractors, if, um, if those employees are impacted, uh, they would have to file a warrant notice. Uh, 
Thanks a lot. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, Governor, the Speaker Johnson this morning was uh, pretty complimentary about the way you've handled the pandemic. Now, the one caveat she had is uh, she would like to see mandatory mask wearing, and we've seen it across the country where it seems to be the mask official coverings, as Dr. Levine refers to it, are really, really crucial to holding down the, the virus. Um, what would it take? I know you're not, you have no plans right now to to institute the mandatory mask, but what would it take to for you to to change that stance? Well, again, you know it's difficult. Even in the states who have mandated, for for instance, New York has mandated, and they can't enforce. We're hearing enforcement issues across the country. Um, I want to promote uh, this. I think I believe uh, that wearing a mask when you can. Uh, when you're uh, when you can't uh, physically separate yourself from others when you're out in the public uh, Everyone should be wearing one uh, But mandating doesn't make it so. Uh, I believe that guidance and education is the key um, And we need to inspire others and we all need to to play an active role in doing that. So um, the numbers would have to change dramatically uh, for uh, Me to to come to that conclusion that we need to mandate uh, we've been, uh, you know, our positivity rate is uh, is way down. Uh, we've been uh, we've been methodically open up, opening up businesses, and we haven't seen any uh, tremendous spikes that would change uh, the my mind in that respect. Uh, but if um, if it came uh, to the point when when um, when the uh, the CDC uh, was to make it mandatory or or uh, we were not seeing compliance in our state and we could find ways to, uh, to enforce uh, in, a, in a different way, then we might consider it. But, but at this point in time, I just don't think it's necessary. I'd rather take the other approach and uh, the same approach that we've, we've taken thus far and have been fairly successful, I would say. All right, great, thank you. Howard, VPR. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us anything. You said we had 10 cases this weekend. We've had a couple of um, small outbreaks, if you will, in Fairhaven and Wyndham County. Do we know um, or can we guess where they originated the first person through con uh, contact tracing? If, it, if these people went out of state, if maybe they work in the hospitality industry and might have caught it um, within, do we know at all where these few outbreaks we've had over the past few weeks originated? I think it'll take a little bit of time for the contact tracing, but uh, obviously they're working on that as we speak. Uh, the cases, I think there was two, I thought there was eight to begin with, but maybe there's 10. I know there was two uh, on Saturday and then another six or eight uh, yesterday. Uh, but uh, Dr. Levine, do you have anything more to add? Yeah, that's always the question we get is uh, how did the first person get it? And in spite of all the efforts one makes, it's very, very challenging when there's community transmission of virus like there is throughout the country now. It was much easier when the cases were all imported, if you will, from either China, Italy, some other part of Europe. Uh, but that's no longer the case, obviously, with all the travel restrictions. And quite frequently, it's not the case that it's even travel into our state from another state. Um, we just find that we, we find a cluster in a, uh, a set of vulnerable people, perhaps, a cluster in a set of employees, a cluster in a family, and those either remain an isolated cluster or they grow into a small outbreak. But actually defining how that cluster became a cluster is really challenging. So the contact tracing does a lot of work focusing back in people's history, but generally that helps us with who might also be uh, at risk of getting infected because they had contact with the person you're interviewing. They don't always help us with who was the first person to give the virus to someone else. So I can tell you right now that uh, in neither of these two circumstances you mentioned in Rutland County and in Wyndham County, do we have um, a firm idea of 
where it all came from, so to speak. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting because I think a lot of uh, civilians, if you will, are very interested in this, but can you clarify, um, is this just impossible to find so you don't, cons it's not worth looking for, it's not something you figure into all the decisions you make um, because it's so hard to figure out? No, no, no. Um, but it involves people's recall quite often, and recall is one of those things where you, you can ask a question five different ways and ask five extra questions, and you still may not get at exactly that critical day, that critical event, that critical contact that led to it all. Um, it's just the, the reality of the situation, especially with a virus that does have a relatively long incubation period. We know the majority of cases will occur within the first five to seven days, but um, we go out to 14 days because sometimes that's what it takes. So it turns out to be really, really challenging. Uh, but again, in terms of strategies to prevent that from happening, um, the goal is always, of course, to focus on vulnerable populations and make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect those vulnerable populations and to do appropriate testing of those populations at times. And, uh, and to make sure that Vermonters try to follow the, the rules that we've discussed that really are uh, great ways at making sure that you don't become a case and you're not exposed in such a direct way that it would harm your health. All right, thank you. That's it. Record time. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you on Wednesday.